Alrighty, let's take a look at question three, which is where we start getting analytical geometry questions. Okay, so this one says in the diagram, A, B, C, which is at two and negative three, and D, which is at negative two and negative five, are the vertices of a trapezium with AB parallel to DC. Remember, a trapezium has one pair of parallel sides. Okay, so before we go any further, what does this parallel situation mean? Okay, remember these two lines are parallel. And what do parallel lines have? Equal gradients. Okay, so what this tells us here is that the gradient of AB is the same as the gradient of DC. Okay, so when you get given stuff like this, guys, write down what it means to you. E, which is the point at negative 2 and 0, is the x-intercept of the line AB. Okay, very important. And the inclination of AB is alpha. Okay, so we're getting a lot of information about the line AB. We've got that its gradient is equal to that of DC. It's got an x-intercept of E, and its inclination is alpha. Okay. Lastly, it says that K lies on the y-axis, so that the angle KBE is equal to theta. Okay, so that's this angle over here. So, question 3.1 says determine the midpoint of EC. Okay, so what you guys need to try and imagine is a line coming from E all the way to C. And we're trying to find the point that sits right in the middle. So it kind of looks like it's going to sit on the y-axis, but we'll have to have a look. So remember, midpoint... is given to us by if you add the x values and you divide by 2, you're finding the middle of the x values. And you do the same with the y values and you find the middle of the y values. So e to c is negative 2 plus 2 for the x values divided by 2. And for the y values, we get 0 plus negative 3, which is 0 minus 3. That means that the midpoint sits at, okay, for the x values, we've got negative 2 plus 2, which is 0, divided by 2 is still 0. And 0 minus 3 is negative 3 over 2. So you can just say minus 3 over 2. Okay, so that is the midpoint of EC. It's here, 0 and negative 3 over 2. Okay. 3.1.2 says determine the gradient of DC. Okay, so remember, it's change in y over change in x. So we have negative 3 minus negative 5, which is negative 3 plus 5. All divided by the change in x. So we have 2 minus negative 2, which is 2 plus 2. That is going to give us negative 3 plus 5 is 2, and 2 plus 2 is 4, which simplifies to a half. So, the gradient here is equal to a half. But remember what we said right at the beginning, guys. Because of this parallel line situation, so is the gradient of AB. Because of parallel lines. Okay. So, 3 point. 1.3 says determine the equation of a, b, haha, in the form of y equals mx plus c. So remember, to find this equation, we need two things. We need the gradient and we need a point. Okay, we've already found that the gradient of a, b is equal to the gradient of d, c. Why? Because they're parallel lines. So the gradient is a half. And we were given that this point e at negative 2 and 0 over here is the x-intercept. So we can substitute that in. So remember, the y value is 0. It's equal to the gradient times x, which is negative 2, plus c. Okay, So 0 is equal to negative 1 plus c, which means that c is equal to 1. So the equation of the line AB is equal to 1 half x plus 1. Okay, so now it says determine the size of theta. Okay, so theta sits in this triangle. If we do this here, this is the intersection of the two axes, this intersection over here, okay? 
And then we've got this triangle happening here. Theta is there and alpha is here. Okay, so how do we find that angle theta? Well, we can already see that is the exterior angle of this triangle. So if we can find alpha, we can find theta. Okay, so alpha is the inclination of this line. And remember guys, as soon as you see inclination, you should be thinking tangent or the tan function because remember the gradient of AB is a half. So that means that tan of alpha is equal to the gradient, which is a half. So that means that alpha is equal to, if we say, shift tan of 0.5, which is a half, we get 26,57. Okay, so that's this angle over here. And now we can say that theta is equal to alpha plus 90 degrees. Why? Because axes always intersect at 90 degrees. And this is the exterior angle of that triangle, okay, which is 26,57 degrees plus 90 degrees, which is equal to 116 degrees, 57. Okay, easy, easy peasy stuff. So now it says prove that AB is perpendicular to BC. How do we prove a perpendicular relationship, guys? In analytical geometry, it's almost always that perpendicular lines, their gradients have a product of negative one. So if we can find the gradient of BC and multiply it by the gradient of AB, we can get negative one and prove that they are perpendicular. So remember this line AB is given to us by one half X plus one, okay? And B is definitely the Y intercept. So B sits at one or zero and one because of that C value. Okay, so now let's multiply the gradients together and see what we get. The gradient of AB we found is a half and now the gradient of BC is change in Y over change in X. So negative three minus one over two minus zero. Okay, that is going to give us one half multiplied by negative three minus one is negative four and two minus zero is two, okay? So two goes into itself once and into negative four twice, but we're going to get a negative, which gives us negative two over two, which is negative one, okay? And therefore, AB is perpendicular to BC. Simple, easy peasy stuff. The moment you see you need to prove a perpendicular relationship, try and prove that their product of their gradients is negative one. So now it says 3.3, the points E, B, and C lie on the circumference of a circle. Okay, so what that means, guys, if we look over here, I'm going to erase all of this. E, B, and C sit on the circumference of a circle. Okay, so you're trying to imagine that there is a circle that goes through all three of those points. Okay, the circle is a bit iffy, but you guys understand what I'm saying. So that E, B, and C are points on that circle. Okay, so now it's saying determine the center of the circle. Okay, so more often than not, guys, they're going to make you use what you've proved before. So what have we proved? We've just proved that that is a 90 degree angle there. And remember, guys, if you have a circle, and you have the diameter going through the middle, it will always subtend 90 degrees on the circumference. And what do we have here? We have an angle of 90 degrees on the circumference. So that means that if we get EC happening, EC is the diameter of the circle. Okay, so firstly, you need to say that EC is the diameter and you give the reason of converse angle in a semicircle. Because remember guys, this theorem here says that if this is the diameter, it will always subtend to 90 degrees because of angle in semicircle. 
okay? But now if we're saying, okay, well, this is a 90 degree angle. We know that there's a 90 degrees here. That means that this is a diameter. It's the backwards form. It's the converse, okay? So what do we know about the center of a circle? We know that it is the midpoint of the diameter. And we found the midpoint. Remember, that point is 0 and negative 3 over 2. So let's call that center M. Therefore, center M is the midpoint of EC. Therefore, M sits at 0 and negative 3 over 2. Okay, easy peasy. Lastly, 3.3.2 says determine the equation of the circle in the form. Okay, remember this is the center form. This is the x at the center, which we've called m, and that is the y at the center. Okay, so we already know that we have x minus 0 squared plus y minus negative 3 over 2, which is y plus 3 over 2, all squared, is equal to r squared. So x squared plus y plus 3 over 2, all squared, is equal to r squared. Okay, so to find the radius, we can find this distance, mc, because remember the radius is the line from the center to the circumference. Okay, so if we find that distance, we find r squared. So r squared is equal to mc squared. Which, okay, so we take the difference in the two x values. So we have 0 minus 2 all squared plus the difference in the y value. So we're going to have negative 3 over 2 minus negative 3, which is plus 3 all squared. Okay, so we're going to get 0 minus 2 is negative 2, squared is 4, plus, okay, so let's put these all over 2. We're going to have negative 3 over 2 plus 6 over 2, all squared. So we get 4 plus negative 3 plus 6 is 3 over 2, all squared. So now we're going to get 4 plus, remember you square both of them, the numerator and the denominator, so we get 9 over 4. And now if we put both of these things over 4, we get 16 over 4 plus 9 over 4, which is 25 over 4. And remember, that's r squared. So now we can simply put that r squared up into this value. Okay, so we're going to get x squared plus y plus 3 over 2 squared is equal to 25 over 4. And that is the equation of that circle, that imaginary circle, that goes through all three points here. This point E, B, and C. Okay, so guys, that is question three. Remember, all of you Euclidean theorems play a role in your analytical geometry. Every single part of maths is related to every single other part of maths. So don't leave those theorems out. Remember, Parallel lines have the same gradient. Perpendicular lines, if you multiply their gradients together, you're going to get negative 1. Just remember, you know, like a diameter subtends 90 degrees on the circumference. These things are important, guys. So just remember all of your geometry theorems and you will be fine. So that is question 3.